Leonard Kleinrock. I'm chairman of the computer science department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes to that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you have chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture is about to begin. Good afternoon. Cookies are gone again. This time they were gone before I got here. <laughs> so I'll accept the contribution from one of you who has so many. Okay, today we have uh, Rick Rashid from Microsoft with us. And he's going to discuss with us making the future happen. So I have to help make the future happen with my usual intrusion on his time and discuss, in fact, how he got to a position like this. Uh, Rick was raised in a small town in Iowa, not a major metropolis as many of the previous speakers have been. So it comes from a very different background. As he said, his was a pathetic school system. Not a whole lot of emphasis on science. The teachers were great, the people were flexible, and that flexibility gave him the opportunity to do lots of things at his own pace. A lot of self-study got involved in lots and lots of things. In fact, in one high school summertime, he worked in a pathology lab uh, in the hospital, and he found that fun, pathology, and educational. Uh, his dad, and his mom, neither one were college people. They weren't in science. They weren't in professional experience. So he came out of this on his own. There wasn't that environment in which he grew up with a strong emphasis on professionalism. In fact, uh, his parents didn't go to college. His uh, brother didn't go to college. His sister did, and she's now a, a well-known anchor woman on a major channel, a TV channel in Cincinnati. <coughs> but Rick always knew he wanted to go to college and set his goals that way. Um, as he says, he was fairly intellectual, did a lot of reading and a lot of self-study. There's a lot of self-growth um, in his background. Um, he's concerned that today's school systems don't give enough flexibility and freedom and challenge uh, of the young generations. Um, on the other hand, he was always interested in science and math. He was also interested in language and literature. So he had a very broad uh, set of interests. But he admits he was poor in metal shop, <laughs> not good in basketball. He was better in the fourth and fifth grade, but then everybody else continued to grow. And people like him and I, him and me, we just didn't continue. So um, I also took up other sports as a result. But. After probing deeply, I did discover that he was a tinkerer as a young man. He did tinker with radios and electronics and vacuum tubes. And he would take a radio and dismantle it and rebuild it. And it would start off as a regular uh, receiver, AM receiver, and end up being a shortwave receiver. And uh, he remembers those days of testing vacuum. You know, you know what a vacuum tube is? <laughs> <laughs> those things with big pins that don't break when you touch them. And you got to test them, and they had, the only way you could test them was to bring them to the local electronic shop or TV shop and put them in something called a vacuum tube tester. He doesn't look that old. <laughs> he doesn't, does he? <laughs> He's not either. But this is a backwards town in Iowa. <laughs> in high school, he was involved in lots and lots of programs, pro various kinds of programs. And his first exposure to writing science science papers was at an NSF summer program in biochemistry at the University of Iowa. And they were doing a statewide model of the United Nations. In his final year of high school, he had no more courses to take. He just accelerated that quickly. Um, so he did self-study, and he even taught a course in physics at that point. So he was clearly beginning to excel. 
He did then one year as a foreign exchange student in Italy, learned to uh, speak Italian, still lectures in Italian. But there's no computer science. Um, when he goes to give speeches in Italian, he translates the computer terminology into Italian, but the Italians don't. Okay, so when he talks about virtual reality, they have, say the words, see? But they really say virtual reality. <laughs> so it gets rather interesting. Um, he then went to Stanford when he came back. Um, he says it was probably because of the Iowa quota. I think it was clearly because of the kind of intellect that we see here already. He paid his own way through the university. Um, while he was there in his four years, he found the tuition doubled. An experience maybe some of you have had while you were here. <laughs> he got two undergraduate degrees, um, one in comparative liter literature and one in mathematics. On his program in both. His math professors felt he did so well um, because he was a literature student. <laughs> his literature professors felt he did so well because he was a math student. But in fact, he did very well in both. And in particular, his mathematics focus was in real and complex uh, variables and analysis, as opposed to probability theory and random processes, the things that we love so much here. He was accepted in the graduate program in mathematics at Berkeley, and he accepted the position. Before he took it, Jerry Feldman, who was at Stanford going to University of Rochester, convinced Rick that there was an exciting program being developed in computer science and artificial intelligence at Rochester. And so just on the personality strength of Jerry Feldman, Rick went to Rochester. Um, basically, uh, another force that drove him there was that continuing in mathematics was not a very strong appeal. He felt he had to be either an Euler or a Cauchy to succeed. And he didn't feel he was, so he moved into something uh, interesting like computer science. And he'd done a lot of computer science at Stanford. Um, he, in fact, spent some time at IBM Palo Alto that one summer, liked it, figured out to take the shot at Rochester, so he did. Now, he got excited in computers in the first place at Stanford. The second computer course he took was a computer architecture course, and Forrest Basket was teaching him. Forrest Basket was not very well organized in preparing lectures and running the course, but he gave the students the opportunity to experiment and play and with, with all kinds of archaic machines and um, learned a lot. Um, that's the point when he got hooked, that course by Forrest Basket. You're going to see a sequence of names appearing here, names you should be familiar with. You know, Rick has intersected with some of the giants in, in our field. He took every course in computer science he could at Stanford. Um, he was there from 70 to 74. Um, when he enrolled in the PhD program in Rochester, there were eight students and three faculty, and no computers. <laughs> He actually described the computing equipment. He had a silent 700. Some of you may remember those old portable machines with the yellow paper. At, I think it was 100 up board that they began at. And then, they, then they went up to 300, I think the later models. At any rate, an appendix logic port, dump, dump terminal, and an account on a machine at Stanford, a Simux machine at Stanford. And they went through TimeNet, not the OpenNet, through TimeNet to get to that machine. That was the first year. The second year, they got some Xerox um, Altos, and they did some data general eclipse. And now, he estimates they had the best computer facility in the country. I mean, who else had Altos at that time to experiment with? His work um, involved a number of things. Specifically, his PhD was um, computer vision interpretation of moving images. But he did lots of systems work at the time. Um, distributed file systems, operating systems, microprograms, distributed games. He is now an expert on challenging patents of people who think they've got the latest or the newest things in distributed games. He has the records of source code they wrote on distributed games back then. And so he goes to testify these things. In 79, he went to Carnegie Mellon as a research scientist. There, we had a terminal-based environment. He'd been in the world of PCs and distributed computing for five years by then. Came to Carnegie Mellon and got involved in distributed systems and distributed AI systems for motion tracking. He then began his sequence of developments in operating systems. Um, SPICE being one of the key ones. 
SPICE is not a CAD program. It's the Scientific Personal Integrated Computer Environment. He did it under Alan Newell. It was developed under Alan Newell and Raj Reddy, small names in the field. Um, young faculty then took it over, and then Rick took it over and ran that program. Um, he says he was a, uh, initially a research scientist there, which is a track running parallel to assistant professors. Now, research scientists had some kind of, um, not permanence of employment, but sometimes ended up with permanence, where assistant professors had permanence, but they didn't make tenure, the permanence went away. Um, he himself became an assistant professor for three years and spent 12 years there. The operating system at the core of the SPICE program was the operating system at the core of SPICE. And that finally led to uh, the mock operating system, a system I'm sure all of you are well familiar with. From 1985 on, he was involved with uh, mock. It was his third operating systems effort. Then comes the summer of 91. And uh, he met the richest man in the, in the world, okay, Bill Gates. And uh, Bill Gates said, uh, suggested maybe he ought to get involved with this research lab they were trying to form. And uh, the driving force behind it was another fellow named Nathan uh, Mirvold, who's senior VP for advanced technology today. Um, this fellow had worked for Stephen Hawkins. Um, and they felt that Microsoft needed a research organization. Who called Rick to convince him of this? It wasn't Bill, it wasn't Nathan, it was Gordon Bell, who in fact was talking with, with uh, Bill about that. Now, the first reaction on the part of Rick was that Microsoft research was an oxymoron. <laughs> okay. So how could they be serious? But when we went to talk to Nathan and Bill, in fact, they convinced them that, that they were. Their vision of a research organization was the same as, as Rick's. Basically, take a long-range view, a lot of flexibility, don't tie it initially to products. Products will fall out of it. There can be some short-term return, but that's not necessarily the only focus, but you need a continuum of, of foci to understand that. And very nicely, Microsoft can be very patient and wait a long time before they get a return on their money. The issue as to how quickly you get returns is a question of how much risk you want to take and how much you want to throw over to the development people to pursue as opposed to the research organization. The most exciting thing that Rick finds about the organization, about which he's going to talk today, is the quality of the people, many of whom he's hired. They're extremely bright, creative. It's like a university, he says. A lot of young people coming and going, okay? new ideas, lots of flexibility. The main difference, he says, is the overall pace is somewhat greater than that at the university. you believe that? And the stakes are somewhat higher. you believe that? In practical terms, it's a, it's a computer science environment. Rather than give you the message now, Rick is going to spend the rest of his talk telling you what his message is for making the future happen. Rick? You actually now know more about me than my wife does. And I don't really think you should tell her. <laughs> well, I gotta, I, you have to be really careful when you say the when. OK, so what I'm going to do, <laughs> I told him if he like, turned this in, into a movie or something, that I get at least some percentage of the royalties. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to be doing, and I don't know if we may want to try to cut the light on the, on the screen in some fashion. If as good as it gets. Possible. Uh, the, what I'm going to be trying to do is, is really give you a feeling for, for both what I think are some of the forces that are driving change right now within the, within the computer um, uh, science field, and, and really think, talk about ways in which, and this, to some extent this is really directed at graduate students, boards, and faculty, really talk about some of the ways in which I think you can, can uh, uh, affect the future, change the future, you know, have an impact. Uh, perhaps more rapidly than you might otherwise think. So, you've got to be careful about, about running into all these, uh, all these courts and things. Okay, here we go, 1975. Uh, if you wanted to have a personal computer, if you didn't actually have access to Xerox Alpha back then, uh, which I did, so I was fortunate, 
uh, this is what you would have, right? This is one of those old Altair uh, 8K basic, this might have been even 4K, it's hard to say, you can tell from here, uh, basic computers. Um, and this, this is sort of what the state of personal computing was in those days. Now, I've got to tell kind of a little story that goes along with this. Back when, uh, a, a couple of years ago, I think like 18, 19 months ago, um, I had to go to, uh, to Washington to testify before Congress for the, uh, the National Inf Information Infrastructure Bill that was going through the House Representatives at the time. And uh, if, if you've never actually had a chance to do something like this, I bet you haven't, uh, let me tell you, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a bizarre experience, okay? First off, nobody goes there by themselves. Yeah, I discovered this uh, as I was as, as I hanged it. Everybody has to basically have a, uh, a shadow, right? Someone who really knows what it is you're supposed to say um, and, who, and who carefully makes sure that you're informed of it before you actually say it. Now, it's not just the people who speak that have such shadows. It's also all the, the, all the congressmen. Right, they all have their staff. In fact, everybody kind of arranges what, what's supposed to be done in, in advance. Um, and they have these hearings, and it's all more or less predictable what's going to happen. But your actual speech, I mean, the thing you actually say, at least in my case, is basically impromptu in the sense that you're not reading from a script. That's already been entered into the congressional record for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, what you're doing is you're supposed to be just expressing, giving a five-minute presentation on C-SPAN. Um, of what it is that you're, what, what it is that you feel about the subject, and of course, there's a stenographer that's typing everything that you say, and it goes also separately into the congressional record <laughs> verbatim, and you can't actually change it. Um, they passed a law a few years ago about not changing it after the fact for some reason. I guess too many people were, were re-editing their remarks to say something different. So anyway, so I, I was put in this position, and, and the one thing I noticed as I, as I listened to the other speakers is that basically this was boring. Okay, <laughs> massively, depressingly, oppressingly boring. So I figured I've got to tell at least some kind of a joke or anecdote, right? I mean, no one else was doing that, and I wanted to be in character at least. So it occurred to me that that that, that part of what I was trying to get across and trying to convince sort of Congress that that in fact there was merit in this particular bill, which was, by the way, to fund university research into uh, the national information infrastructure, was was to really to relate the, the extent to which our children, the, 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 this, the generation that's now growing up, um, is, is becoming tied into and involved in computers. And uh, um, so I told a little story. This is actually completely true. I didn't even make it up. Not that other people don't when they give presentations to Congress, but this is a true story. Um, and it kind of relates to the topic here. My, my son, which is now, now 13, my oldest son, at the time, years ago, was about six. And we, we went through this process every night where he would ask me questions. This was his way of staying up, right? <laughs> if he could continue to ask me questions, he could continue to stay up, right? Until such time as he ran out of questions, in which case he had to go to sleep. Um, and the questions would be about all sorts of things, you know, just any old topic. But one evening, he, he looked at me very seriously and he said, Daddy, when, when you were a kid, did they have 8-bit computers? <laughs> Uh, there's one, right? And I, and I, unfortunately, of course, I was born long before this one, so I had to say, well, no, actually, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't even, ha you know, individuals didn't even have computers, you know, and we we didn't even have color TV. <laughs> you know, this is pretty bad, right? Uh, I, I think the point that, that to be made here is that there's just been a just absolutely dramatic shift, right? Um, <laughs> Somebody said, he doesn't look that old. Well, <laughs> that could be. But you know, just in my lifetime, we've gone from, from, from basically the point where, where computers were existed, but in, in a very, very arcane way, used by a very restricted collection of people, uh, to the point where um, they've become a dramatic part of, the, of, the, uh, of, of our civilization. I mean, back in the early late 1970s, early 1980s, this is part of what that change was, is you made this transition from sort of these very earliest kinds of machines to something that was actually being used in businesses and helped to create this, this, this personal computer revolution. But really, this is where we are today, right? This was, this was in a lot of people's Christmas lists for, for 1994, 
as what their children <laughs> felt was an adequate computing environment. Okay, uh, this is certainly. I, I, I took this off of my son's Christmas list. <laughs> if you think I'm lying, he even wrote the prize. Okay? He, he reads the magazines. He knows how much things cost, right? So that's 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 what's happened, you know. And, and this has been really, you know, what's what's of course driven a lot of this has been this tremendous change in, in the processing power that's available. I mean, if you look just to the Intel line. You know, there's just been this absolutely fantastic change, you know, roughly doubling every 18 months uh, or more over the last, over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years. And that's what's really changed our computing environments from these really pathetic kinds of computers that, uh, that my son would recognize as computers uh, to the more advanced environments we have today. So you're getting this enormous uh, increase in computing power that's really the result of the microprocessor. There's also been this equally dramatic increase in storage. Right, so I mean, the, partly you see this in RAM. Like this little laptop that I'm using here is 40 megabytes of RAM on it. Okay, just as an example, it's, all, it's also a Pentium. Uh, the, the enormous increase in, in disk. In fact, disk now is increasing in density and, and decreasing in price far faster than, than, than semiconductor memory. You're seeing basically a 60% increase in aerial density, which is really the the key the key number that says, you know, how much data can I store on the disk every year now, all right? And that's why when you go to the store, if you if any of you go to the store to buy disk, you're seeing this absolutely dramatic shift in, in disk prices. Um, a year ago, uh, just in a regular store, quantity one, you, you'd probably be paying at least a dollar a megabyte for disk. Now you're paying less than 50 cents a megabyte. Um, and in large, for the large size disk, now you're paying 30 cents a megabyte. By next year, you'll be paying 15 cents a megabyte. Okay, for the large capacity disk. So there's just a tremendous change going on. You know, optical storage is certainly part of that too, but actually it's the magnetic medium that's changed the most. So what are the implications of exponential change, right? So what I'm describing is an exponential change process, and I'm sure you sort of all abstractly know about this because you read the newspapers, you read the, the textbooks just as well as anybody else. It's important to understand what, the, what these implications really are. One way to think about that is to say, gee, what's going to happen in the year 2000? Well, by the year 2000, your, your average television set, and this is not an exaggeration, it's probably, in fact, an understatement, uh, is going to be faster than any of the fastest supercomputers that, are, that exist today. Right? That'll be your average television set. The really you know, high-end ones you know, that the, uh, the audio and video files buy, well, those, who knows what those are going to have on. It is literally the case, and if you don't believe me, you can think back as, as to what this was 10 years ago, that children's toys are going to be faster than anything that you use today, right? And that's, again, not an exaggeration. Think back of what children's, children's toys are today versus what the computers that we were using, you know, 10, 15 years ago were, right? If, if you want a, a, a specific point, I skip, skip by it there. Uh, if you pick up a Sony PlayStation, which you can only do in Japan at the moment, but they'll go on sale in the U.S. in, in a few months. I mean, here is a reasonably powerful, uh, uh, here's a reasonably powerful MIPS-based uh, processor uh, with a graphics engine capable of doing something around 300,000 shaded polygons per second. It wasn't very many years ago, like about three, when when that was considered to be exceptionally good horsepower for a pretty reasonably high-end silicon graphics workstation. So there's a significant change that's been going on because of these exponential changes. I already mentioned, you know, that the home gaming system now is, is becoming the Pentium PC in terms of the volumes that are being shipped into the home. And in fact, you're, you're get, beginning to see a shift already to the point where, where the number of computers being sold into the home is a very significant fraction of the number of TVs that are being sold into the home. Along with this change in the nature of the of this sort of exponential change in computing, well, I should just make one other point about exponential change. Just, just something to think about, especially for you as you're, you're you know, in your graduate program and thinking about where things are likely to be once you get a job and move on. The, it, it's the important point to recognize about exponential change is that, is that exponential change means that everything that happened up to now doesn't count. Right? I mean, think about it. It means that, that everything that's Every, if you go out a few years in the future, what exponential change means is that, is that, is that every, at that point in time, everything that has, all, 
all the effective computing that will ever happen will have happened after I've, I finish this talk, okay? Because everything up to now just is irrelevant, right? Because exponential change washes away the past. And that's important because people always keep thinking, you know, even when they recognize exponential change, they have this tendency to think, I don't know why this keeps bobbing forward. Uh, they have this tendency to think of exponential change as, as something that is, you know, it's important that somehow won't affect them as much. And it's going to affect them dramatically. How is this affected the computer industry? Well, these, this slide, one you've already seen, uh, give you a pretty good indication of that. What you're seeing is here is, is what, you know, when I was starting my career at, uh, at the Carnegie Mellon University, what the computing world looked like to me. As a researcher, as an academic, if I had to go out and take a set of ideas or take a set of technologies and try to convince someone to bring those ideas to market or to take that, 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 those, uh, uh, the, those technologies and productize them or use them in some fashion, the world I looked at looked like this. Well, let's see. I could go to IBM or I could go to DEC or I could go to Hewlett Packard or NCR or somebody else. But they had these, these extraordinary sort of vertical companies that basically encompassed everything from the processors, the microprocessors or the or the breadboard of processors, all the way up through to installing the, the, the systems and consulting and helping you with, with your running your computing environments. It was a very kind of, you know, well, I could be an IBM shop, or I could be a DEC shop, or I could be an HP shop type world. What's happened now is that this exponential change in, in the nature of computing over the last 10 years has really created a completely different landscape in terms of, of what, are the, what does the world look like and how do ideas get moved into this world? How does technology advance? Um, how do you create the marketplace for ideas? What you see here is that now, if you want to buy a processor, well, you could go to IBM. Okay, They make a clone of an Intel processor. Um, or you could go to Motorola, which makes a clone of an IBM processor. But, but basically, you know, there are relatively small number of companies in the processor business. There are relatively small number of companies in the, in the, in the, the uh, computer assembly business, right? which is what computer manufacturers are now really are, they're assemblers. Peripherals, networking, operating systems, and so forth. So you see this, this sort of horizontal nature of the, of the computing world. You've also seen a dramatic shift in what computers are actually used for. Right? Back when I was a, a, a student back in the 70s, when I first went to Stanford in 1970, that's what the computers I, I used looked like. In fact, that is exactly what they look like. You know, there's this IBM computers, a 370, a, 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 36067 is what we had at the time. Looked exactly like that. They had guys in white coats um, that uh, managed the thing. All right, you never actually got to physically uh, get into its presence. You could bring it a, a box of cards uh, that they would happily stick into the computer for you. Uh, never fear if you drop the cards. Uh, there were machines that, you, that they also had that would resort them into the correct order for you. Um, yeah, numbers, I remember them. Sorry? <laughs> Oh yeah, we had to number the cards, but if you didn't do that, then, then you were pretty stupid. <laughs> but clearly, you know, these were machines that weren't going to be used by ordinary people who do much of anything ordinary. The turnaround time was, you know, hours or days. Uh, it made ex assignments exciting toward the end of the semester. Uh, so what these machines were used for, they were extraordinarily expensive, and they were used primarily for ana ana analysis. So analyzing information, doing scientific computations, um, doing things that really required an enormous amount of, of, uh, of horsepower. As you moved into the personal computing world in the 1980s, there was a significant shift in the way computers were being used. They're not, no longer being used just for analysis. Of course, that part of computing never changed. In fact, people were doing more analysis in the 80s than they did in the 70s. Uh, but the, the dramatic shift was a shift toward computers used as tools for creating things, for authoring things, right? Tools for writing, making reports, spreadsheets, uh, tools for writing programs, uh, tools for, for those, that portion of our society that is willing to create something, okay? Willing to create documents, art, or whatever. What you're seeing now and this is the other, now we're on the other side of the exponential change, the, the sort of you know, 1990 side of the exponential change business, is you're starting to see this shift, and, and you just have to read the newspaper every day to see it, as, as computers are now being used not just as a vehicle for, for analysis, although we're still doing tons of that, more than we ever did before, 
not just as a tool for authoring, although we're still doing tons of that more than we ever did before, but they're now also being used as a, as a tool for consuming, okay? That's not the consuming in the negative sense, right? This is consuming in the positive sense. Uh, so they're used as primary delivery vehicles for uh, information, for data, for documents, right? People are reading now more and consuming documents more with their computers than through paper. They're being used for listening and reading and viewing, right? They're being used for communicating. In fact, this is now becoming an extremely dominant portion of their uses. They're being used for storing and managing information. And increasingly, um, they're being used not just to, to help people consume, but to advise them about how they're going to consume, to aid them in that process, right? Uh, they're really being used more, they're, they're becoming, I hate to say this, more of, of sort of your friend, okay? <laughs> or certainly your agent um, in, in, in handling information. And you, you're seeing this you know, as, as part of this consumer computing revolution. So we're seeing all sorts of different kinds of devices. Nothing quite yet as wild as either of these, but it won't be very long, right? You're already starting to see handheld, handheld devices uh, that begin to approximate some of these capabilities. Uh, maybe not full color and some of the other characteristics, but we're not very far off of that. Uh, wireless, of course, interconnected, of course, doing all the things that you could do with, with things that might be in your wallet or on your person. Um, and you're already seeing uh, computers being used in experimental situations, at least, as televisions, as viewing tools for information. I mean, you're seeing them in watches, right? This watch here, this is actually a, 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 a Microsoft Timex watch, right? There's a little optical receiver at the top of the watch. I know you can't really see that, but take my word for it. Somebody else has one, or somebody, somebody's showing their hand around, so presumably they must have something. Basically, this, you hold this up in front of your, of your computer monitor, and it, it optically transmits your schedule onto it. So I've got my three-month schedule on my watch here. Right? So th that's the way in which computing is, is beginning to change the world. So we're on the threshold. Some people probably don't like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the threshold of really a very significant change in computing, really away from the analysis and authoring you know, to this consuming. Now, whenever something like that happens, it, it makes for, for an opportunity to sort of reevaluate where you are, right? Much like as we made the change, um, uh, Len was saying earlier, that, uh, talking about how when I went to, to Carnegie Mellon University, I went to get involved in a project there called SPICE, the Scientific Personal Integrated Computing Environment. It was really a project that was designed to try to, to uh, tackle the notion of personal computing in an academic environment, but it was the notion of personal computing. And during that period, both at Xerox, CMU, MIT, Stanford, and a number of other places, there was a tremendous amount of change that occurred as people grasped what a personal computing environment might be like uh, and how people might use it to create the sort of authoring world that we're in today. Uh, what we're now seeing is, is this very significant change toward consumer computing, and that again gives us this opportunity to reassess where we are in a number of different areas. At the same time, you know, we as researchers, you know, always have significant impediments whenever a change occurs. It's true every time we've gone through one. Uh, one of the big issues, and I'll talk about this more at the very end of the talk, but one of the big issues is that, is that this new computing world is being driven by, in many cases, not computer companies, but by companies or organizations or rationale directed at consumers in different kinds of markets, markets that computer scientists might not necessarily uh, be as involved in. To give you a feeling for that, I was just at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, this uh, earlier in the month, earlier in January, and, and when, two or three years ago, personal computers were, were, were really not a big item at the Consumer Electronics Show. I'd say they were 30% of the show this year, right? I mean, it, it, the computing world, and if you then took into account all the computer-like devices uh, that people are using, you're probably talking about 50% of the show. So it's just a tremendous change that's going on, but driven not by programmers, not by computer scientists. The economics of the, mar of the marketplace are different as well. You know, and I think we always have to take into account the fact that, that the research organizations and institutions that we create you know, in a field like computer science don't just, you know, that they're 
they will age like, like people will age, right? And so there's, there's always a tension trying to make sure that you're, uh, that you're attempting to do the right thing and that things like the, the government can, can handle it. So let me switch gears. I, I've talked a bit about, you can see by every time I set that down, it's almost going to pop on me. Uh, the, I've talked a bit about this, this notion of, of, of change that's going on. So Len's already told you my life story. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you a little snippet of it. We, he didn't go into it in a lot of detail. Uh, basically, the reason I, I went to Microsoft, the reason I decided to go there to start a computer science program at Microsoft, you know, really boils down to this. It felt to me, and I, and I hesitate to use the word change because that seems to have become a democratic uh, you know, thing. I guess now it's bipartisan, okay? But uh, we'll ignore for the moment the political uses of the word change. Uh, the, uh, what I felt was important was to try to find a way to get you know, I, you know, research and technology moving rapidly as, I, as, as you moved into this era of sort of consumer computing. Uh, I thought there was a really unique opportunity in Microsoft specifically because it was a software company. And the key notion here is that a, a software company is in some sense the purest play from a computer science perspective in the sense of being able to take ideas and algorithms and technology uh, at that, that's developed, and much of what happens in computer science department is software, software related, and moving that into into use in, in some fashion, moving it into 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 products in some form. Um, there's also a fact which which Len alluded to a little bit, uh, but I just want to make that point more strongly, which is that a software company, in a way, is kind of unique with respect to other types of companies in the computer computer business, in the sense that it has to be in order to survive, driven by new, new ideas and new technology. That is the absolute requirement. Um, the reason is, is fairly easy to describe. Nearly 50, if you take Microsoft, for example, and I'll be using Microsoft as an example here, but, but much of what I'm saying could equally well apply to a Lotus or, or Nobel or, or one of the other top software companies. Something like 50% of Microsoft revenues come from products that have been introduced in the last 12 months or product upgrades that have occurred during the last 12 months. I mean, it's, it is, it's a very dramatic aspect of the company's uh, income profile. In fact, one, another way of saying exactly the same thing is that, generally speaking, people don't buy old bits. Right? They, they buy new bits. They buy things that are changing. They, they buy new technology or new features in their software. Um, things like our consumer division is, is at a pace where, where today it's releasing 50 new products a year. And you're beginning to see the same kind of production occurring from some of the other companies with consumer organizations like Novell. Uh, the upgrades of existing products now occur on a very, very rapid schedule. And this is a change over the last, say, you know, five years ago this wasn't true. But now you're seeing new products and new product upgrades being driven you know, dramatically into this 18 to 24 month cycle. So that's another important aspect of what's happening. So fundamentally, the, what drives a company like this or, or that type of an organization, um, and increasingly what drives a computer business, is this need for new technology and new markets because that's where much of the growth comes from. So if you look at like, you know, Microsoft's growth pattern, right, it, it's almost, ex it, it, the biggest spurts in this growth occur around key new products, you know, whether that was you know, the introduction of, of, the, uh, of Microsoft Windows in 89 and 90, uh, or Office, or uh, now the consumer, Windows NT and the consumer products. You're seeing that driven very much in, the, in that. And also you're seeing a, a really significant different kind of mix for products than I think people have quite realized. Where now the applications business is dramatically larger than any other business now as far as as far as the computer software business is concerned. And the fastest growing piece of this pie is consumer. Right? That's the fastest growing piece. In fact, I think at this last Christmas, the numbers I, I heard were was almost one to one. Uh, PCs being sold into the home versus, versus the business. I mean, for the calendar year, I think it's like 30% now. Uh, but it's expected to grow to be something more like half. So with Microsoft Research, uh, you know, we, we wanted to, to somehow create a computer science or research environment in which, in which the, we would be able to fuel uh, the kind of change that, that we felt needed to happen in the, in the 
computer science business. And we've grown fairly rapidly. So we've been going for about three and a half years. And there are now roughly 80 researchers in Microsoft Research covering a whole bunch of different areas. I, I didn't really include everybody here, but you know everything from natural language speech, we have software development environments and programming analysis, uh, decision theory and statistics, uh, operating systems, which is my own particular area, networking, user interfaces, animation, 3D graphics, uh, believable agents. I'll, I'll show you more about what I mean there in a moment. I'm going to concentrate. This isn't all we're doing, of course, but I just showed you the other list. I'm going to concentrate and just quickly talk about, about some of the work we're doing in two areas that really relate to this consumer computing theme that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one is this, what I call advanced interactivity, just really this question of, of if in fact consumers, if in fact computers be, are becoming consuming devices, you know, how do we bridge the gap? I mean, the reality is that the, the graphical user interfaces that, that we've all come to become very familiar with and accept uh, are, are reasonably good as a way of having the computer control the user to get something out of the user. But they're, but they're less good. They re weren't really designed so much to interact with, with, with normal consumers uh, who are more task-oriented, more interested in solving their problems than they are in, in fiddling with the computer. So we have to find ways to bridge that gap. And we're looking at all sorts of different technologies for doing that. Natural language and speech uh, are clearly important. User interface design, 3D graphics, uh, decision theory, social interfaces. And I'll talk more about each of those in a second. Uh, we're also pushing in the systems area because as we start to talk about building a, a consumer computing infrastructure, a lot of that has to do with the systems that have to support it. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So I'll just hit on a couple of, of points here for some of these, these different projects that we have going on. And then I'll show you a tape that kind of integrates these things together in, a, in an example of what we're doing. Uh, one of the areas that we're working on is speech recognition. Uh, the system there is, uh, that's being developed is called Whisper. Uh, Whisper derived, in fact, the group actually, although it's unrelated to anything I did when I was at Carnegie Mellon, some of the key group members came from Carnegie Mellon. We saw the, uh, strong ties back to CMU. Uh, the interesting thing is that we've been able to build now a, a speech system that will run in very, very small amounts of memory um, and can, with continuous speech recognition, with a reasonably large vocabulary. Uh, and the very first product based on that have already been shown in this, this last context. Clearly, speech allows you to get input from someone, but it doesn't let you figure out what they're talking about or, or, or give you a great deal of in information about what might be going on. We also have a very uh, strong natural language group, and, and they're really trying to cut through the confusion in what people will say, or what people will write. Right? So here are the, the classic kinds of natural language examples, right? where you'd really like a computer system or even another human being to be able to figure these things out. Uh, so things like, well, yes, I, you, almost any computers today can figure out that you misspelled the. Um, a reasonable grammar check will probably give you the the uh, the, the, the mismatch in the uh, uh, in the uh, the number of the of the subject and the verb. The I saw the Grand Canyon flying to Arizona starts to get exciting, um, <laughs> and the, the ladies are requesting not to have children in the bar. Uh, it's even more exciting. Uh, I don't know what that is in Italian. And, and this is the national language system that's being built. Um, that's addressing that, and again, we're starting to spin things off. One of the key things you realize when you start getting into language, I just put this up here. If any of you are doing natural language research, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about, uh, which is just this enormous connectivity between words in English and their meanings, and the relationship between their meanings. And the key bit of technology that the group that we have at Microsoft is currently working on is a way of automatically extracting all these relationships from dictionary and other source materials, so that it's not, it doesn't have to be entered by another human being. We take into account the fact that most of, of our knowledge of language has already been entered into source materials, that if only we could read those, uh, we, could, we could get that semantic information back out of it. And this is just an example of the relationships that were gathered uh, for BIRD, and the fact that the network spreads out way past the edges of the slide. We're also working very strongly, again, all these are technologies that relate to interacting with people uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a reasonable way, in terms of representing information uh, for users. So there's work going on, for example, in the area of, of 3D graphics uh, and uh, rendering. We're doing a lot of work in terms of modeling of graphical surfaces, uh, dynamic animation, uh, the use of, of resolution-independent surface representations. That's what subdivision surfaces uh, represents. It's sort of using a wavelet-style uh, approach to talk about the uh, representation of surfaces rather than using nerves or rather than using a polygonal structure, which is 
uh, dependent on a particular resolution of the, of the underlying description. Um, and we're looking at a lot of techniques for, for optimizing graphics uh, so you can do high performance rendering. So what I'm going to do now, if I can get the videotape, can I get the videotape? Okay. What I want to do now is show you a, a, a videotape of uh, something which some of you actually, it, it suddenly showed up on, on CNN last week. And I'm not sure exactly you know, why it was on CNN, but this is a system that we've built. Um, uh, it's really a combined research effort taking all the different technologies from the different research groups and putting them into a, uh, yeah, go ahead. Putting them into a system uh, to really create a believable, interactable agent uh, that can perform a series of operations for you. Uh, this particular one, okay, this particular one is, is uh, called Phoebe the Parrot. I'll let, uh, let the tape speak for itself for a minute. Good afternoon, Phoebe. <laughs> Let's do a demo. Another demo today. Hmm, okay. What do you want to hear? What do you have by Joe Jackson? So Petey's a CD mm -hmm. player agent. What have you got by Joe Jackson? something else. How about simple feelings? That sounds good. Okay. Then I'd like to hear something from Jesus Christ Superstar. Thanks, 
So basically what you're, what you're, what you're seeing there is a, a bunch of different things all at the same time. Part of PD himself, the graphics, were being put up on a, on a Silicon Graphics workstation. That was all being done dynamically. The whole system was actually running on a PC uh, that was actually a Windows NT machine sitting off to the side. So that's what was handling all the speech, um, all the natural language, all the other, all the other processing. So the, the SGI box was being used as the, as the display agent, or this display engine for it. Uh, PD's animations were part of a, a dynamic animation system uh, that was built uh, within Microsoft Research. The, there, there's a, a whole set of potential animations, and the system is deciding based on the circumstances um, in the current situation at each point in time, both what are the appropriate animations to occur at that particular instant, uh, but also what camera angles to use. So when you saw the system switching from one camera angle to the other, uh, there was a decision being made within the system as to, to figure out which camera angle was most appropriate given the animation that was about to perform and the operation that was going to be going on. So that's part of what you were seeing there as well. The speech system that was, that was uh, driving this was Whisper. Uh, the, natural, the whisper input was being taken and driven through the natural language system, which then would produce a series of what were called logical forms, which are basically the logical representation of what was said. Right? So when you say something like, you know, or can you play some Madonna for me, or you know, can you find something, that was being turned into a, a, a logical form that maybe was a representation of the action that was supposed to be performed by PD. Uh, there was a code written to support each of the potential logical actions for this domain. Right, so that's what represented the, the things that he was doing. He also has a number of emotional states, depending on the circumstances involved. So that's why he would get, he couldn't hear, if he didn't get it right, right, then he was going into a sort of puzzled mode, right, and uh, uh, or or put his hand up to his ear to, hear, to try to figure out what was going on. So there's a series of things like that uh, that were built into the system. So this is a different kind of user interface. Um, but for those of you. Several people now told me, but I guess there was some newspaper article recently um, that indicated that, that they knew something about this new program Microsoft has called Bob, okay? And the fact that Microsoft was, was in fact trademarking the name Bob, so that everybody who had the name Bob was going to give it up, okay? <laughs> this is, it's amazing, you know, that plus, that plus buying the Catholic Church. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that there's anything sufficiently outrageous that people won't assume that Microsoft is going to do. Uh, but, Bob is a is a early version, if you want to think of it that way, of a kind of a social interface designed for sort of novice computer users. Uh, that is the very first step in this kind of direction. But clearly, something like PD the Parrot, you know, moves that much much farther forward. The interesting part about this is, although you know we had a pretty substantial Windows NT machine running PD on the one hand, um, and we had a Silicon Graphics machine doing the display for PD on the other. The actual computational horsepower for everything that you saw there will be well within the capabilities of PCs that would be sold certainly by you know, Christmas of 1997. In fact, far better than anything you've seen there in terms of graphics capabilities. Um, and probably by Christmas of 96. So really, you know, we're not pushing with these types of systems the envelope of computational power um, that are needed to run them. Okay, so that's that's talking a bit about the sort of the, the user interface or interactivity aspects of consumer computing. Some of the work that we're doing in trying to push the systems aspects, I just want to touch on now as well. Uh, I'll talk really about two two topics, uh, which are subtopics of what we're doing. Part of this is, is is in looking at how do we build a systems infrastructure to support people actually doing significant computing in their home for the purposes of consuming or improving their lives or doing whatever they feel like, entertainment. Uh, so how do we build networks and protocols for metropolitan areas? How do we build a system infrastructure and kernel support for that? And the other part of it is, is how do we build scalable fault-tolerant systems that will support it? So one of the things that, that we're doing at Microsoft is, is we're involved in, in uh, building an a, a interactive TV infrastructure. Initially, we're going to be fielding this system in, in the Seattle area. So the beginning of the system will go online this year in Seattle. In fact, the very first homes to start playing with the system will, will uh, be coming online within the next couple of months. For those of you who don't know, I mean, if you, if, if a lot of people will ask me uh, about 
you know, well, how are we going to get information to the home? You know, they understand this notion of cable TV, but they don't understand exactly what a modern cable system looks like or how we turn a modern cable system uh, into, a, uh, into, a, in, into a networking infrastructure. So I'm just going to give you a quick description of what we're doing. Basically, if you look at your cable system today, I don't know what cable, what's your local cable system around here? It's a TCI or? Century. Century, so it's some, it's, is it like owned by some holding company of TCI or something? I mean, or is it Time Warner? In, something like that. Time Warner, okay, so it's a Time Warner on thing. So I don't know exactly what your local cable looks like. In our environment, um, and in most modern built out cable environments, what you'll see is, is what's called a hybrid fiber coax um, uh, communication structure. Where, where you have a head end which feeds fiber, uh, analog fiber, out to a series of neighborhood nodes. Each neighborhood node then translates, there's, there's a translation from, from optical to electrical. Um, and then some number of homes are serviced by your, your electrical analog cable. So, and typically that number, I think I've got that in the next slide. Typically that number is in the 500 homes past, as they would refer to it. Although the actual number varies dramatically by by the neighborhood and the age of the cable system and a variety of other things. So it, it can range from as small as 100 up to 3,000 homes past. You know, if you're at the end of the 3,000 home, that's why you're getting such lousy cable reception. You know, if you're in the 100 home node area, you're getting pristine reception more likely than not. A typical cable system today has, has a downstream capacity of something like 450 megahertz. Okay, so you're capable of carrying signals. So there's a number of six megahertz channels spaced in the region from 50, well actually it's up above 100, to 450 megahertz, right? So that's sort of roughly what you're looking at. So if you've got a cable system that has exports 36 channels on a, on a single cable wire, uh, more likely than not, that's, this is what their cable system actually looks like. And there's upstream, or going back to the head capacity. Uh, typically, uh, the spectrum is used for that in the 5 to, to 40 to 50 megahertz range. Now, you, if you ask the question, like, why don't they use that for the downstream or why they need an upstream. Well, they need an upstream to get the authorization information from your cable box to get pay-per-view, right? And why do they use that part of the spectrum? Because that's the noisy part of the spectrum. That's the lousy part of the spectrum. In that part of the spectrum are ham, is ham radios, lawn mowers, you know, um, all your favorite, uh, uh, you know, friendly electrical devices, uh, FM radio stations, and so forth. So it's not a good place to be. Okay. We start talking about turning this into a network Okay, turning it into a network architecture, uh, this is what you begin to see. What happens is that suddenly, and, and I'm not describing what we're doing, uh, and, and we're building our stuff all around ATM, what, what you see is that at the head end now, we have a, a number of computers, right, rather than the traditional transmission of, a, of, uh, of other equipment. We have ATM switch now as the, as the switching backbone or fabric within the head end. Uh, and then we still have this, this fiber coax distribution structure. Um, and I'll... But now, instead of transmitting the, it's just analog data, we'll take the region above 450 megahertz and start transmitting in, in digital form there, basically using some form of, of, of digital modulation on top of those analog channels. So a typical technology here would be something like um, a quant quadrature amplitude modulation for those double E's in the audience. Uh, for everybody else, it's basically just a way of sending bits um, over these um, analog TV channels. So a six megahertz analog TV channel can carry, using this particular modulation technology, after forward error correction, because there's a lot of errors that occur because of noise in the, in the environment, something like 27 megabits per second of information. Right. So you're really saying that each six megahertz TV channel, you know, in this range, is able to carry, you know, roughly three Ethernet's worth of data, okay, out out into the home. And of course, I can have, you know, a hundred channels. What? Compound. You know, Every series for each. Um... No, each. But basically, the way to view this is that over each six megahertz channel, that would be a traditional TV channel today, I can carry 27 megabits of information. Now remember, I have this network already in place in most modern cable systems where I'm already spanning out fiber to neighborhood nodes. So that means each collection of 500 homes can have you know, whatever megahertz range you want to devote to this problem. We're using 450 to 750, okay? Times, you know, divide by six, 
multiply by 27, that's the number of megabits per second that we can transmit on the downstream into the home for those 500 people. That's a lot. Okay, That's a lot of information. With newer lasers we, and, and newer, um, newer uh, amplifiers, you can actually ex spread that range. And some cable systems now are experimenting with going up to a full gigahertz transmission capacity. Uh, so that, again, that just expands the range of potential digital services. What you see here is, is basically a, a description of what this digital network looks like, where you have the Fourier correction modulation, laser transmission over optical um, um, fiber to the neighborhood node, conversion to electrical, and then transmission over the coaxial plant into what are called either set-top boxes, the STBs here, uh, the cable companies and the phone companies often refer to these, these things as, as CPEs or customer premise equipment. You know, they have great terminology in that business. I said this already. Uh, actually, with newer modulation technologies, uh, like 256, Bob, you can actually carry it up to 3842 megabits per second per 6 megahertz channel. So it's just a lot of potential capacity here. Uh, the, the backstream, you don't get nearly as much capacity. Uh, but again, 64 kb to a megabit is perfectly is perfectly possible, uh, even in that noisy part of the, of the spectrum, right? So this is the kind of environment, the kind of infrastructure we're building the protocol, and all in, in, in the, the, the complete structure around that. As I said, we'll be fielding systems in Seattle later this year. So that's part of what we're doing for this infrastructure. The other part of what we're doing for the infrastructure is to build um, media servers um, and other kinds of backend server devices. They can really support the actual uses of digital information for that many people. So some of you may have read in the papers about a system that we built called Tiger. Tiger is really our code name, um, nothing else, for a, uh, a, a scalable, fault-tolerant, uh, distributed system that can, file system that can support quality of service guarantees. So uh, I mean, this is a picture of what a Tiger system looks like, just a series of machines which the cheapest ones we can buy are PCs, so that's what we use. Uh, just a series of machines, you know, each one of which acting as a server with a set, set of disks associated with it, using ATM fabric as its communication structure. And then feeding out through the ATM fabric, you know, through the cable distribution facility, you know, into the, the set-top boxes or, or players for, for people's homes. So the key thing here is, is, is the key notion of a system like Tiger is the fact that, that Although any individual video stream that you're trying to send it might be two megabits per second or an MPEG-1 or four megabits per second or six megabits per second, you've got to basically guarantee from the time someone starts to watch a movie or some other video, digital video data, to the time that, that, they, that they finish it, that they're going to have that. They're going to have that capacity and you're going to reliably send exactly that many bits per second with, with very little jitter because you can't be bursty in your transmission. You have to transmit in a uniform fashion to go through the ATM fabric, you've got to guarantee that for a significant period of time. So what we've, what we've done, and this, this started within Microsoft Research, and we're now feeling this as part of a, our product activities in Interactive TV, is to build a distributed system that can do that, okay? where the individual components do not have to be supercomputers, don't have to be remarkably powerful, you don't need RAID disks, um, you don't really need much of anything other than off-the-shelf disk, disk drives and off-the-shelf computers that that literally my son could go into a store and buy and, and wants to. <laughs> but, you know, it's already got one computer. I can't just give him lots more. So what we're doing with Tiger is we've, is we've built, and this work now started about two years ago, um, and it's now really you know, uh, being, being fielded uh, in, uh, in our product activities. Build a system which has distributed load balancing. So anybody, if I've got 1,000 movies on the system, 1,000 videos, 1,000 audio programs, um, and a thousand people listening to them, and that defined capacity for the system. Any number of people can be, can be doing the same thing at the same time, or can be doing something different. It's fully random access, doesn't matter. Access patterns are not taken advantage of in the architecture. Uh, it's scalable in the sense that you just add more processors. The algorithm is fully distributed, so there's no centralized component to the, to the underlying algorithm. Low latency in the sense that it's about a second from the time you, you push the button to the time a movie starts, which is better than a typical VCR. Uh, the, most of the delay, by the way, is, is in the MPEG decoding. Okay, there's about 300 microseconds, milliseconds built into the MPEG decode time by itself. So there's a certain amount of that built into it. 
and you can do fast forward and reverse, all those things. We built this system, and this was part of, of, of the research emphasis, was to build this system in a way that really could sustain failure so that any disk could fail, any, any whole processor could fail, or an entire tiger system could fail, and, and the clients could recover from that. And there wouldn't be any loss of service, um, or, you know, in particular with disk or processor failure, there would be no loss of data in the system. So you wouldn't see any change in the, in the video screen. Um, and of course, support for hot spares. This is because we just don't trust hardware manufacturers. We're software people. We don't trust hardware people. Um, and I think the key thing that we've shown with this, and what's been exciting about this particular research project now turning into a, to a product development activity, is that basically it means that small children can, be, can go into the video market. Now, I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing, but, but there's no, there's, you know, you know, a single PC can drive uh, 30 MPEG streams up, it depends on really how you configure it, you can drive up to 100 MPEG streams off of a single PC. So, and then you can aggregate. Okay, so there's a tremendous sort of you know, low starting point, you know, and high ending point here. And when people keep talking about, well, what does it cost to store um, movies on disc, you know, you know, rotating media versus to store them on videotape? Well, the, the simple answer there right now is that the price of, of disc dropping is dramatically in the past minute. The, the actual cost of storing these movies today in, a, in an MPEG-1 digital form is less than what a blockbuster video won Blockbuster video typically pays to put one movie on a shelf uh, for, uh, for several people to come in and buy. And of course, here you could have many thousands of people watching it at the same time, as opposed to just you know a few. So there's a a big difference there. How many video on demand channels are usable by one of those communities? You have maybe 38 channels of those broadcast. Right. The, the question is how many how many video on demand channels are available. The answer is it's, it's really not defined quite that way. Right? You've got a, a certain amount of spectrum. And you've got data that you're sending on a spectrum. So on a 6 megahertz TV channel, I can send 27 megabits of information, which means that if I've got you know, a 2 megabit you know, MPEG-1 movie, then I could easily transmit you know, something on the order of, of you know, 12 or 13 of those simultaneously on that one channel. And do you think is 2 megabits compressed MPEG good enough for the, there are all sorts of issues about the questions are is two megabits good for home use? The answer is that the it, it varies widely. If you buy a CDI disc today with movies on it, that those are encoded at 1.5 megabits per second. And if you if you uh, pick up the digital satellite DSS systems, those have variable um, compression rates, which range from about two uh, to six, and I think for some of the content they make up as high as nine. So it varies dramatically by the nature of the content and how well it's encoded which compression technology is being used to encode it. Um, so the answer is, you know, it's going to depend. Okay? And typically you're looking at variable rates for different kinds of content. Higher quality content can be compressed better. Uh, noisy content compresses more poorly. MTV compresses very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it, right? I mean, there's not much, you know, 30 frames a second, they're all different. <laughs> <laughs> I've compressed MPEG, I've compressed, you know, uh, uh, MTV content, right? Because we, we've done this for, for our internal purposes and for doing presentations and so forth. And believe me, it doesn't compress very well. <laughs> okay. That's what the is. So I think the key thing, I think the key thing here is that is, is I talked a bit about what we're trying to do in Microsoft Research. I talked earlier about what we're, about the, 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 the changes. Now I want to, I want to sort of direct my presentation to you. All right, I've talked about what we're doing. I've talked about what I thought the, some of the opportunities are. I've talked about what we're doing. Now I want to talk about what you're doing or what you could do. All right. Clearly, I think, I personally believe that we're sort of in a, at a watershed event uh, in terms of ch changes that are happening in our field. This is a great opportunity. Right? Opportunities are, can be good or bad, of course. Um, when you think about how we can get some of these things to have an effect, you have to look at both sides of the equation. Right, so when I talk about how do I get my ideas, I mean, a common thing that somebody will come up to me and ask me, uh, it seems like, is, is you know, how do I get my ideas into a product? How do I get my ideas out? Or how do I have an impact? Well, it, it, there are two sides to this. Right? It's not just a question of how do you organize research, but it's also a question of how do you organize development. Part of this is development groups need to be organized in a company in a way that allows them to accept new ideas. And then research groups have to be organized, and this applies equally well to academic environments, I in a way that is, allows a great deal of flexibility in how ideas can be trans, transmitted. 
and taken on. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that flexibility in a second. Oh, and of course, beware of prejudices and bad attitudes. We'll get to that later. Uh, oh, I thought you get bad attitudes. Okay, one of the things that Microsoft does, which I have found to be in my role of, of sort of director of research, vice president of research, to be an enormous advantage to me personally in terms of trying to get groups to accept ideas, is, is they have people within the product group. Um, this was true before I got there. This is just some historical thing from Microsoft, whose role it is to uh, to take ideas and bring them into products. These are these are, are are called program managers, right? Their role, in some sense, is communication, interaction between groups, specifying products, um, helping to direct product activities. Uh, so that you've got this product team, which is which is not just development, it's not just people writing code, um, it's not just people testing code. And by the way, with Microsoft. The ratio between development and test is one to one. One developer, one tester. Okay. This is you know, an interesting fact. Not everybody realizes. <laughs> if you include the user community, it's like you know, millions to one, right? Um, the, and, and user education documentation is, is almost one to one with development. Not quite. Okay, it's like two thirds, two thirds to one. Okay, so these are pretty significant roles. And program management is a real key part of this, and it makes my life a lot easier. The program managers really do product specification direction, but they also facilitate communication with the outside, and they often are the ones that are acquiring technology, either from outside Microsoft or from within Microsoft. You know, in, in working with Microsoft research, so they work with with people on my side, the research organization, to help move ideas back and forth. Right. Again, in a company that's directed, in, in, in an organization where you have to keep adding things, keep moving technology forward in order to survive, you've got to have people whose job it is to actually do that. Is this the same as product managers? No, it's not the same as product. Product managers are different. I mean, I, I try to avoid the, the product management is a marketing function. Right. Okay, I, did, I sort of avoided that. I mean, this is the development part of Microsoft. I'm describing. From the research perspective, you've got to be remarkably flexible. I mean, many of these things were true actually when I was at Carnegie Mellon as well, that I would, I would see this, this, these types of relationships. And I've seen us transfer ideas now in all of these four ways. I mean, one way, of course, is the, is the classic, simple, straightforward way. You've got an idea, you convince someone else it's a good one, and you're done. Okay? That does work sometimes, and it's actually a great thing when it happens. Uh, another approach is, is for development teams to directly productize research prototypes. This is also something. In fact, you see this happen more often, I suspect, with spin-off companies. Um, although you'll see it happen within Microsoft some as well, where you take a research prototype um, and you'll say, my goodness, that's a tremendously good idea. Let's start with that and then let's try to turn a product out of that. Right? And, and a lot of spin-off companies, especially spin-offs from universities, will tend to look, work like that. A couple of things that we've done, in addition to those, is our, our one thing that we've done, which is kind of interesting, is to occasionally say, the research guys have a set of ideas. Uh, we have, a, you know, we'd like to bring that into development. We don't, you know, but there's a, there's an information gap there. So we'll actually take a development group and basically have to report into research for some period of time until such a time as the idea can be moved into a, a more traditional product direction, more product focused. And that's another approach that can work. Um, and and then another approach is to basically say. Let's take research and advanced development teams and have them actually be like a spin-off company, go out and form the core of a new business unit or a new, new business activity. Tiger is actually an example of, of some of this. I mean, basically, Tiger started out as a, as, as a research activity. In fact, there was a development group trying to do something similar. I'm sorry, to tackle a similar problem, not do it in a similar way. Um, and this was an example where the development group had this great development plan, but we actually were able to just come up with a much better idea to solve the problem, which required much less time to produce, um, and was able to, to sort of you know, attack the problem better than would have been done in the more traditional development setting. Uh, so the conventional development project was effectively killed by the research project, okay, uh, or the prototype that came out of that. Uh, initially, the Tiger product group directly reported to me, actually, um, under research control as a way of getting this technology transferred in. And now there's a legitimate development group with its own development manager associated with it. So that's an example of part of what I was just describing. Um, so what are the, some of the reasons why we, technology transfer doesn't happen? 
Well, some of that is because, you know, in this, you know, bad attitudes are all over the place. Uh, the, you know, one bad attitude from the research perspective that I've actually heard, in fact, this is, these, these are all quotes that I've actually heard people say, all right? So I'm not making these things up. In fact, this one came from a, uh, a director of another research lab. I won't say which one. Okay. Uh, which is basically like, we're basically here to do just enough to keep them happy, right? And then don't leave us alone. Well, that's kind of a bad attitude. And you're not going to expect to see, I think, a lot of research results show up in the products if that's the attitude that you're taking. Uh, here's another attitude that's actually, I've, I've, I've also heard. Uh, this actually came from a graduate student uh, at another university, so you're safe. Uh, and uh, it, was at, it was at a technology transfer workshop uh, that ARPA was holding. And uh, you know, one of the students uh, who had just finished his PhD, actually, uh, was, was lamenting the fact that it was so darn hard to get these, these fundamentally thick-headed people in these companies to take on ideas, right? And he said, basically, you know, I don't understand why they won't use our ideas. You know, they, like, they want everything on a silver platter. Right? And again, if you come in with that attitude, right, the chances are good that the guy or the woman or whoever's at the other end of the exchange is going to look at you like, uh, why should I bother? This person isn't really very interested in, in, in doing work to get me to use the ideas. They want me to do everything in order to bring in a new piece of technology. Uh, here's another common attitude. I think this was another one from uh, yet another uh, meeting I had at another university uh, where, where this is fatalism. Okay? This, is the, this is the fatalism attitude, which is we can't do anything to change it. You know, the world is this way. It's been this way since the beginning of time. Uh, you know, these people are too too locked in their ways. Nothing can be made to, to improve it. And again, this is a really, really good way to give up and never never have anything happen. Um, and you know, this is a this is actually another quote. This is from a university professor. Uh, again, at a different university. Uh, and um, I thought this was remarkable. I've actually met someone. Uh, this guy. <laughs> Who actually thought, he was very proud of the fact that he'd never even been to a software store. Okay. What? I mean, he's very proud of that fact. You know, like, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't, yeah, this is, this is beneath my dignity in some sense. Well, again, if you're not willing to keep up with the pace of change, if you're not willing to keep learning new systems, I mean, a real common problem, for example, I see in a number of research environments is that, you know, the, the uh, uh, this will happen, for example, in the programming languages area, where you'll see people that have, you know, grown up on, on programming in Lisp or, or Scheme or, or something, and they won't take the time or the energy to learn what programming language and techniques are actually being used in development environments in such a way that they can actually convince these people to use the techniques that they find it in their own. So bridging that mental gap, they're not willing to take the step to learn the other person's side of the business sufficiently to make that, to make that transition. Again, I think once, once, and all these are real. I mean, I didn't make any of these questions up. So, what is it that your advisors have been keeping from you? Well, I think actually they probably haven't been. So, I, I put lots of things in parentheses so I wouldn't get beaten up by Len. Uh, oh, after having a long speech about my life, I don't know. <laughs> uh, one thing I think that's really important, and I know when I was uh, working with graduate students, somehow, I mean, no matter how many times I would say it, it never, never quite seemed to quite sink in. You've got to be as creative at selling your ideas as you are at, at generating them in the first place. Right? You have to find ways of getting your ideas to fit into the matrix in some other organization in such a way those people can use it. And that could be another research organization, by the way, uh, or another part of your department, or another group that, that just isn't your particular group. But you've got to be creative. You have to understand you know, what are the, the, the pressure points and the sensitivities of that group. Um, and, and find ways to take your ideas and make, make uh, use of them. Part of this involves developing a broad background. And if I had to say, if somebody asked me earlier today, you know, what, was, what were some of the things that I would like to see you know, students coming out of the universities, you know, what, what property I would like to see them have, or they being well enough trained. Um, and one of the key things I think that I see, especially you know, from a research perspective, you know, when we get you know, new PhDs coming in to, to talk with us, is that you really would like people to have as broad a background as they could possibly have, in addition to being very, 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 very good in their specialty. 
But you're not going to live your whole life through special. Remember the, the exponential curve, right? That means everything up to now doesn't count. That means that mostly what you've learned doesn't count, right? Which means you're especially may not even be an interesting subject in three years, <laughs> right? Which means that if you don't have some basis for learning more or, or branching out into other areas, you're stuck. Right? And you're not probably going to be the most productive research citizen um, out into the future. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, keeping your ears to the ground, right? And, and not excluding opportunities to learn. Well, I already brought that up in the bad attitude section. So here is the sort of the major, making the future. This is the, the slide here, making the future happen. You really have to know the market for your ideas. You have to know. And by market, I really mean, I, mean, I don't just mean money. Okay? I mean, the intellectual market for the ideas. I mean, how you're going to find a way get your ideas into a different into an organization. You, you need to be able to take advantage of, of an explosion that's currently happening in software. Yeah, as I said, look, you, you saw the you, you saw the, the, the exponential growth in computing, right? And then the, the, the equivalent exponential growth in Microsoft. Right? Those are related to each other in an obvious way. You know, the software world is able to take advantage of this tremendous growth in computing. The computer science community has this as a tremendous opportunity to move forward. Right? And one of the ways to do that is to, is to be able to grasp onto the state of the art in that software world as it moves forward. So things like being able to take advantage of the growth of component software. People aren't doing that as much in the academic community, but there's a tremendous opportunity there. And by component software, I mean the fact that now virtually every application being built by companies like Microsoft or Novell or Lotus and so forth are being built as a series of communicating objects and components which can be interact, which you can put together in lots of very interesting ways. You know, Microsoft Office, for example, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel. Those aren't just programs that run; they're servers. They they're, they can act on a series of messages that you can send them. They're components of larger systems, right? And all the software the structure and the environment for doing that is is there. And you can go into a a, a mall shopping, you know, a, you know, a shopping mall in a bookstore and get every piece of information you'd ever want to know about how to do that. Uh, respect that horizontal structure, the, 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 not the vertical structure, right? The world has become horizontal, and you have to recognize that it's become horizontal. So when you think about taking your ideas and moving them into, the, into, this, into this world, you have to think about the fact that there are many companies, they're all playing different roles, so many different kinds of opportunities for you, and you can play some of them against each other. Take advantage of this new distribution media. Right. This is really important. Right? Anybody now can basically, I mean literally anybody, I think my, my kids could publish CD-ROMs. Right? It's, it's sort of where the world's gotten. My kids could publish things on the internet. Right? Many of you probably already have. But it's one thing to put up a web, web page. It's another thing to realize the opportunity that exists for the academic community in distributing software and, and distributing information, um, not just to themselves, but to the broader, broader community out there. I think you're beginning to see a little bit of that. But I don't think you're, you're seeing as much of that happening. For example, you don't see very much universities getting into the shareware business, and yet they could be, right? There's nothing that would prevent them from being in that business if they wanted to be. Um, and then recognizing the engine for change, I've already talked about. Okay, I don't want to run off too late. You've been a remarkably patient audience, so I'm going to reward you, okay? Uh, I've got one more video. Can you, can you cue that up? Uh, I kept it to the end. It has only vaguely to do with anything I've talked about, but it's so funny. I really wanted to show them. <laughs> if nothing else, it shows that we might Microsoft have a sense of humor. Okay, this is the tape you can't make. Okay. It shows that nothing else we have a sense of humor. It gives you a feeling for sort of what's going on with the information highway. Hi. The pyramids. The Coliseum. The New York subway system. <laughs> And TV dinner. Ancient and modern wonders of a man made world all. Yet each fails to be insignificant with the completion of that magnificent accomplishment of 21st century technology, the digital superhighway. Once it was only a dream of technoids and a few long forgotten politicians. <laughs> in the 20th century. Let us recall the pioneers who made this technical marvel possible. The digital highway would follow the running trail, first blazed by Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> Though some were incredulous. Yes. 
phone company. Stirred by the prospects of mass communication and making big bucks on advertising, David Sarnoff commercializes radio. Never had scientists been put under such pressure and demand. The medium and produced America to new products. Say, Mom, windows for radio means more than just that great means of use for all. You should enjoy windows for radio at home and at work. In 1939, the Radio Corporation of America introduced television. Never had scientists been put on the same. This is Booty Week and Hot. We are Lady Dot. Wonka, Wonka, Wonka. Jeez, a hundred channels and he's on every one. <laughs> came with the deregulation of the cable television industry and the re-regulation of the cable no, television no, industry. No, no, no. <laughs> we get to work with all this, this cable and to now the broadcast has bought some of our money. I mean, it's ridiculous. And the re-deregulation of the entire communications industry. What a fantastic year for this monstrous global entertainment company to be built. You're a mental maniac. Your own company is psychotic. <laughs> Computers, once the unwieldy tools of accountants and other geeks escape the back rooms to enter the media greatness. The world and all its culture reduce to bits the lingua franca of all media. And the forces of convergence exploded. Finally, four great industrial sectors combined. Telecommunications. Entertainment, computing, and everything else. <laughs> For new media applications. I've seen you a while back, and you got a list, three pages long, single space, double lines of services that he thought we ought to explore together. In the frenzy for digital dominance, alliances were formed. Columbia has sold itself to Sony to more than three billion dollars. Time Incorporated and Warner Communications. Two and a half billion dollars in Time Warner. QBC Network has proposed a merger of 12 and a half billion dollars to buy Macaw Cellular Communications. Viacom, the company behind MTV and Nickelodeon, is buying Parallel Communications. Bethlehem Steel became Bethlehem Steel and Entertainment. <laughs> to Chrysler Studios, and Weight Watchers launched the Virtual Eating Channel. <laughs> channels for the gourmet, and we'll see channels for the pet lover. Next one will make a channel. All industry was in play as investors flocked to place their bets. At stake, the battle for you, the consumer, and the right to spend billions to send a lot of information into the farmers of America. <laughs> With an information highway across the USA, everybody be shopping in a whole new way. See the stuff on your TV. It's like having a spin bomb in your own backyard. <laughs> so catch it on the movie, play a video game, watch Punch and Judy, it's all the same. The digital convergence can bring it all to you, and it must be progress, cause it's all brand new. <laughs> channels coming down the line it's kind of confusing even for Einstein <laughs> so come on the super highway and bring your PC to phone companies are there now and they can network you you can do your banking and you can buy your stocks you can order with your TV box, you can be a friend now. Start a relationship, 
Cyberpunk Teenagers Say it's really here Uncle Sam's got his hands in He couldn't let it be Making lots of regulations At the FCC Out in Silicon Valley And down in Hollywood They're cutting big deals now And looking mighty good Subscribers, make a hot way man. We're well, tuned in tomorrow, and we're sure you'll see that the pictures are there, and so are we. Well, the pictures are there, and so are we. Well, the pictures are there, and so are we. Well, thank you very much.